almost there. All right, here we go. Everything's ready to roll. All right, let's call this meeting to order the June 10th, 2021 meeting of the Salem Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. I'm Dylan McDowell and we will go through roll call. Mickey Varney. Here. Alan Alexander. Here. Tony Cato is absent. Woody Dukes. Here. Dave Frydenmaker. Here. Rick Hartwig. Here. Heath Norris is absent. And Paul Rice. Present. Perfect. Well, thank you all for joining. We have uh, some great presentations today, and I will note uh, at the start that we are going to make one adjustment to the agenda and move our parks and um, parks and natural resource planning update uh, to the start of our board items because we have Rob Romanak with us today. So we'll go through our minutes, public comment, and then we're going to hear from Rob before he has to leave for another meeting. So thank you, Rob, for uh, making time for us tonight, and we'll make sure to fit that in. First, let's start with our minutes. Um, hopefully everyone has had a moment to review those and I would love to hear if there's any changes or proposed adjustments to the minutes. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? I move adoption as, pre as presented. Second. Seconded by Rick. Okay, let's do a voice vote. All in favor to adopt the minutes, say aye. 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 Any, uh, all opposed say nay. Okay, it's consensus, I passes and the minutes are adopted. Thank you all. Moving into our public comment. I know we did not have any written public comments submitted. And as far as I can see, we do not have anyone signed up for public comment today. Tony, um, just to verify with you on the record that no one has contacted you, correct? No one has contacted me. Okay. Well, we will move right into our agenda items. As I mentioned, we're gonna first hear from Rob Romanak. And um, as you may have noticed, Patricia is not with us tonight, unfortunately. And so we are just gonna move the whole parks um, and natural resource planning update up to right now. So if you could also go to that page in your packet, and if you have other questions about those updates, um, we can ask those of Rob and see if there's anything, uh, if he, and if he doesn't know, I'm sure Patricia can follow up with us as well. But just to give some preface for this, um, many of you may have heard that City Council decided to send Gear Park back to staff, um, mostly based on the parking concerns uh, around the uh, 94 spaces, I want to say, and how we could look at how the city could look at further reducing those or making language clear that that would be indefinitely the maximum and looking at possibly transportation studies. So Rob is, is going to share with us what the next steps are and uh, what staff is doing at this point and how that will proceed from here. Hopefully I characterized that cor correctly, Rob, but I will let you take it away. Yeah, thank you, Chair McDowell. Good evening, board members. Uh, that is correct. So, so uh, last city council meeting, um, the the item was returned to staff, that they voted to return it to staff, um, both to look at reducing the parking quantities and to uh, look at expanding the size of the dog park. So those are the two changes that um, staff and the consultants are looking at alternatives right now. And we are looking at the parking uh, numbers very carefully. We do not have a uh, have a, a clear uh, alternative that we're we're moving forward at this point. But we do hope to to you know modify the plan and return to SPAB in July to present that to you before we go back to City Council. Um, I, I will say we our direction was to reduce parking, and, and so just to be clear that that is what we're looking at doing. Um, there are multiple options we're considering. Uh, one of them, I'll just say, I'll just be very clear or you know, be very open with you is to look at what's in the current park master plan and that is head in parking along Park Avenue. Um, one of the problems with that is, is that there are street trees and so we would be impacting street trees. So um, there are, I'm happy to take questions but I'll just tell you that, that there are gonna be pros and cons with the various alternatives that we're setting right now. And, and just lastly, uh, we are not um, doing a formal traffic analysis at this time. Um, we, we are working with our design consultants to really look at what options there are to meet the, the direction from council. Thank you, Rob. And could you clarify on the dog park, what steps are being taken to incorporate that? And could you remind us where did the dog park end up in the planning process in terms of public comment? 
Um, yeah, it, uh, the, the dog park was a one of the more popular elements. Uh, however, I, I will note that we, we didn't get any specific uh, comments in through the process about the size of the dog park. So our, our objective was to, to uh, kind of match with which what we see in other cities and, and what's kind of found in other places in the city, like, uh, for example, Cascade Gateway Park. Um, that, that one's relatively straightforward. There's opportunity to um, move move closer to the existing baseball field um, to perhaps, you know, kind of, if, if I could pull up the plan if you would like, but our, our concept generally is to, to, to site a small dog fenced area to the northeast um, of what we're proposing where the dog park is today. And then the area we're proposing would be enlarged to be only for large dogs. So, so that's that's our kind of our approach to, to um, expanding it. One change that will probably be a consequence of that is we'll lose a, a, a proposed picnic shelter. Um, while we develop the dog park, we could look at having a shade structure in there for the users, um, but it won't be reservable. Thank you. Um, any other questions from the board? I think Mickey, you had a few questions, correct? I did, I did, but others, <laughs> Others can go ahead if they'd like to, either way. Why don't you take it away and then we can move forward from there. Okay, well, I, um, wow. Um, it was interesting listening to the city council meeting and then I did review a lot of the gear park master plan that was submitted and looked at the comments. Um, one of the things that stood out to me uh, in the, master plan was, um, you know, the survey that went out, one of the comments that was in, not in the survey from a respondent, but actual uh, summary of the survey said, it is unclear, however, if people are opposed to having multiple additional parking lots. So it was interesting that it didn't show up in the surveys. However, it did show up sometimes in the comments. So I don't really know how Every, everyone feels. Um, I realized the council has some concerns, um, but there was, when I looked at the comments, there were a lot of comments, both supportive of parking and not supportive of parking. So I just wanted to mention um, uh, that. Let me see my questions. Um, so I don't remember if we asked this before when we reviewed it, but what is the what proportion for spaces to softball fields, for example, in Wallace? And how does this, these parking spaces, these additional ones compare? And the reason I'm asking that is because uh, there seems to be a need because of the uh, fields that are going in uh, and that being one of the needs for additional parking, so. <laughs> that's, a, those are, that's a great question. I don't have a comparison tonight. Um, for, for example, comparing Wallace to, to gear in terms of fields, I'll tell you that the, the rationale for behind the, the proposed master plan is that that, that multi-use fields would generate the need for 40 stalls approximately. And we did pare that down a little bit when we proposed the, the, the 96. Um, uh, I, we initially um, in the second open house presented a concept that was relatively similar to what came forward. And it, it initially had 140 parking stalls and, and um, you were correct. There were comments received through the process about the, you know, not over, not overdoing it on parking. And so we initially did a, a minimal recommendation and that's what was presented. Um, moving forward, you know, we, we've gotten pretty clear direction from the council. So we, we are just, our, our intent is to reduce the parking. Okay, well, that makes sense. So with that in mind, if you totally remove the parking element from it, is there a process to add spaces back in later? Um, so so I, I, there's, yes. So, so you could amend the park master plan in a future time, or you could update it to add parking lot, parking more parking in. You could um, also corresponding with the development of amenities that would require it, you could uh, look at other opportunities uh, offsite shared use agreements or something like that. Okay, all right. Well, that answers my questions. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, Alan, I saw your hand and then Dave. Uh, yes, I'm concerned. Uh, I don't, I realize we reduced it 
I, the planning folks to reduce the number of uh, original uh, parking spots, but I'm concerned because there's not like a lot of neighborhoods that, that butt up against that park. People have come to use it. It's a it's a it's a regional park. Most of them are going to be in a, some kind of car or maybe some bikes. But uh, and if we cut the we cut parking a lot now, putting it back later is going to be many factors more expensive to add it back later. I'll, I'll, I'll just, I don't know if that was a, really a question there, but I'll comment anyways. I'll, I'll, I'll just want to add that, that, you know, I think one of the issues is that, that there could be times that are, it's like peak use demand for parking, perhaps not a typical day when there is a tournament or, or, or there is a lot of use of the ball fields as well as other park amenities. In those instances, uh, one option could be to look at uh, overflow parking. Um, you know, that's something we're going to look at. I, I expect that we're going to have some development code issues with that um you know the kind of there's rules for everyone in the city when they develop not and it's not about par not limited to parks but it does include parks and so the parking development standards i i do not believe allow for like a grass field or or something that isn't paved to be used as overflow parking but that's something we can certainly look at and we are through our, our process right now I would just hate for us to to modify the park to the point where it's not it's not easily usable. Yeah, and I, I just I also kind of reaffirm that that we are reducing the parking proposed in the in, from the initial proposal. We're not we're, we're going to come back with some additional parking proposed. Well, we look forward to seeing it in July. Dave. Um, I had the concern about reducing the parking uh, for some of the same reasons, I guess, uh, that Alan did, because it's not really, this park's not really in a neighborhood, it's next to one neighborhood. And I know last time we talked, or when we uh, passed the, or uh, recommended approval of the plan, I remember I brought up uh, a question about uh, the infrastructure for even biking into this park, which is not all that simple, uh, and walking to this park is not all that simple, and it's probably not going to happen, and I really don't want to see the park underutilized because people get there and there's no place to, to park their car. Um, I'm hoping that maybe some, some parking could be added for electric vehicles, maybe, for spaces like that, and that would not impact greenhouse gases so much. Um, but I'm really concerned about spending all this money on a park and then not having it utilized fully. I, I, I understand all your concerns and, and I, I'm gonna just, you touched on electric vehicles, so I'll bring that up. We are going to take this opportunity to look at, um, you know, make sure our, our cost estimates and, and, and it's very clear in the report that, that we will be making the new parking EV charging ready. So not necessarily that we're committing to putting in those chargers, but if, if it's running conduit or, or whatever needs to be done, um, we want to make sure that's included in the vision, included in the cost estimate. Okay. Paul. Oh. Um, yeah, we're, uh, during the discussion with the council, uh, we're, uh, was it brought up that the fact that you had already reduce uh, the proposed parking from the original uh, draft and uh, you know from the 140 down to 96 so they were aware that you had responded to some of the public's concerns about too many park too much parking but um, but they felt it should be reduced further then yes I, I do recall mentioning the this what I said very similar to what I said earlier that the, we had an initial concept for 140 and it was reduced based on partially on public input um, to, to generate the preferred concept I, I did state something similar to that at council and so, so they were aware any further questions for Rob about gear park Mickey? I I still, well, I just have kind of one, let's say there's an event and there are a lot of people parking on Park Avenue, which I believe we discussed at our last meeting a little bit. Um, I did see some comments about the fact that there's a lot of vehicle traffic 
uh, a lot of vehicles that are driving very, very fast on that road. And I was wondering, is there any particular liability on the city if there are city leagues, city sponsored events or whatever, and there are issues with pedestrian safe, what, safety or issues with park, you know, anything out in the road there? I was just curious. I, I, I'll do my best to, to answer that. And if, if I don't fully answer it, you let me know and I'll, I'll try to get some more information for other folks. What I would say to that is, is during the design development process, so for example, if we did head in parking on Park Avenue, for example, um, and, and took that forward, when we actually got to design that, that modification to the road, we would have uh, civil engineers and traffic engineers involved to, 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 and their professional judgment involved and, and their professional liability insurance involved um, to, to help make sure that we were designing a, a space that, that w thought about those issues. Now, in terms of the city's potential liability, I don't know if I can fully address that. So I'd have to, I'd have to come back with an answer. Sure, I was just curious, thank you. To Dave's point about biking and accessibility there is, if you reduce parking, is there a way at this level of the plan to try and increase bike access and thinking about that aspect of it as you revisit the plan? Is that something that's on, on deck right now? Um, I, it's certainly something on our minds. I don't know if this individual park master plan is a great opportunity to do you know, extensive trail planning around this area of town. Um, but, but I will say that we're having discussions with the state who's the majority of the property owner around the site. And um, we're certainly very sensitive and aware of the comments we've received through this process about the need to improve um, pedestrian and bicycle access. So there, there's a lot going on behind the scenes to try to come up with something. Um, but I, I, I can't say too much about it right now. It's really just, just having discussions. Thank you. I still had another question just sure. really quick because I'm not as familiar with the area. Is there a bus stop there or what are the options for public transportation? And I mentioned this because I think of getting people to use public transportation more, but then one of the draws of the dog park, I mean, the park is the dog park and Councillor Hoy did mention at the council meeting that one of the drawbacks with using public transportation is you can't take your dogs on the bus. <laughs> So is there a bus stop close by? I was just curious. Yes, there, there, there is. I, I consider it close by. It's, it's approximately half a mile walking distance. Um, and <laughs> it is on, located on State Street near the Hawthorne intersection. Um, it is on Chariot's core network. So it would have relatively frequent service or it does have relatively frequent service. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> And if, so Rob, in terms of next steps, you and the and staff will put together an updated plan to bring back in July at this point, that's the trajectory? That's right. Uh, you know, we have the consulting firm on this, this project is Greenworks and they've done projects elsewhere for the city. They did the Riverfront Park Master Plan. Uh, they have a reputation of innovative green design. So we're, we're trying to push them right now to come up with some creative alternatives. Um, and, and then we're, we're hoping we be ready to bring something back in, in July. Great. Any further questions about Gear Park? Um, yeah, yeah, just a, just a comment. Uh, I'm on the Citizens Advisory uh, Board for Chariots, and uh, I can, we're having a, uh, a meeting next week, and I can I can talk to them about the uh, the the service in that area. I would imagine that if that area is gonna get a lot more use, a lot more traffic, uh, uh, that they may want to, to reconsider their, their, their routes and the frequency. So I, I'll bring it up. Perfect. Um, if it's okay, Rob, I'd just like to open it up if there's any other questions about the Parks and Resource Planning Update broadly that you might know the answer to if anyone has questions. I had one that could be a Patricia question, so happy to follow up with her. Um, but I know I talked about the public tree survey and that the um, that the consultant had been hired and the survey was intended to go out this summer, but a draft would be sent to SPRAB first. And I didn't know if, if you or Tony perhaps know more about the timeline of that. 
I'm not super familiar with the timeline. I, I know that there there is a uh, kickoff meeting for staff coming up, so so okay. I, I think they're you know we're really about to get to work on that. Um, but I, I don't have a firm timeline for when like the survey is targeted to go out or anything like that. We would have to get back to you. That makes sense. Any other questions before we let Rob go to his next meeting? Uh, did you did you ask about the parks update? Too? I mean, the yes. natural resources or whatever, because yes. I was yeah. curious, but I also see, see Jennifer is on here, I think, isn't she? Because um, one of my questions was, uh, how are the park area closure signs working now that they've been put in the parks? And that's something we can talk about later. If now is not the appropriate time, I was just curious. I think, Rob, your meeting's at six, right, that you need to run to? Um, no, I have a little more time, but but I I, I will say I, I if if they're referring to the the eagle eagle for the eagle nest in, in Minto is, is that what you're referring to? Oh no, I'm sorry. I was thinking more of Wallace. I'm sorry, I wasn't wasn't clear. So after the cleanup, when 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 the signs are put up to try to close areas so that they're available for <laughs> recreation, et cetera. I was just, I had not heard anything and didn't know how that was working out. Yeah. Mickey, oh, go ahead, Rob. I'm oh, sorry, I was saying, uh, Jennifer Keller will probably be able to address that a little bit later in the agenda. And I think we will come back to our normal updates and talk with Jennifer a little bit later on, but we wanted to move Rob up just uh, begin, just because he has to go. And so if there was anything else on the on the natural resources side, then be, uh, he might know the answer there. But otherwise, I think Jennifer and Tony will hopefully have some answers for us later. All right, well, thank you so much, Rob. Really appreciate your time and look forward to seeing the updated plan. Great, thank you all. Thanks, Rob. All right, let's go into our presentations. So first up, we have the summer recreation and softball programming update. And I saw in the chat that Melinda's gonna go first, followed by Billy. And let's make sure that they have audio and visual. There we go. Hello, Melinda. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. I apologize. I think my microphone unmuted during part of Rob's presentation. <laughs> so I apologize for that. That's all right. It looks like you're maybe out in a park. So that's, that's good. <laughs> yes, I'm in the middle of a meeting getting started also, but I won't keep you guys. We have um, a lot of programs getting ready to start. This weekend is our um, first stride event. We have 30 something people signed up. That tends to be a last minute registration. Um, so hopefully we'll get a few more over the next day and day and a half. Um, they tend to be fair weather participants. So we'll see what happens there. Um, we have several camps we've already closed due to um, full enrollment with COVID. We have to put a cap on registrations. So we have a few camps that we already have met our limits and we are taking wait lists for. Um, we are getting ready to bring on the rest of our summer staff and get going with programs here at the end of June. That's great. And does, as we were talking at the start with the projection of hitting 70% vaccinated by the end of the month, hopefully, does that change summer programming in terms of if restrictions are dropped? Um, and, and is there a plan for that? So uh, hard to say. I would imagine it could, but because the youth can't be vaccinated um, and a lot of our programs are 12 and under and vaccinations are 12 and over, right. I'm not sure how those restrictions will change for them per se. Um, we, if we need to open up registrations, I think we can accommodate for that. Um, and I think we'll have enough staff that if we lift capacity numbers, we'll be able to accommodate the additional registrations. Perfect. Yeah. Any other questions from, well, Melinda and Billy, I guess it's up to you. Would, Billy, would you like to talk first and then take questions? Or I don't know, Melinda, if you have to run to that other meeting in the park. It, it might be better to let Melinda take questions. Okay. I would appreciate it. I, I'm yeah. sorry to ask. <laughs> Not a problem. Any questions for Melinda from the board? All right. Well, thank you for joining us, even though you're outside um, and we'll let you get to your next meeting. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. As well. All right, Billy, the floor is yours. All right. 
So we've been running leagues since the beginning of April. We started on April 9th. I hope this doesn't jinx us, but we made it all the way through our spring the first six weeks without, I'll just use the initials we use for it as an RO. Um, we actually had our first figure out what the first letters, the last letters out, um, weather-wise. Um, we had our first one on Tuesday night and until 535 we were playing and then, uh, and I've heard about this. It didn't rain in East Salem. It didn't rain in South Salem. But it poured at Wallace after my staff had everything set up, ready to go. We It was actually the first night of a league. So we were going to be doing check-in for the new uh, Tuesday night men's league. And it poured. And people don't understand that it rained at Wallace. And we want to play. They thought we just didn't want to do any check-ins. I don't know. Um, my staff was soaked. All the paperwork was soaked because they couldn't get it in. And um, with the wind that brought that rain in and just – but. I will tell you 15 years of doing this. I have never gone till June before we've had an RO. So, um, and plus playing before that, I just, it's un, it's unimaginable, but as you guys know, we are in a drought and it does affect a lot of things negatively, but it's great for softball. Um, league wise numbers. Um, we have just started, we're starting our summer league. We, what we did was shorten the spring league, made the summer league longer and doing a, a regular size fall league. As of right now, we have registered 134 league teams. Last year during COVID, I was very bummed out and thought it was bad. We had 85 teams, but we didn't start playing until the beginning of July. And um, we are like, that's like what's uh, our, our normal number. Uh, in 2019, we had 134 teams. We have 130 what did I say? 140 teams that have already registered this year. People are ready to play. Um, to answer some COVID things, we are still under uh, a percentage, 15%. Um, for those of you that don't know, at 29,000 square feet, we could actually have 3,000 some people in the park by the matrix that the state uses. But we shorten that down because there's not a lot of room once you have bleachers that we have closed because of COVID guidelines. Um, we've been allowing, uh, we're up to 40 people, 40 persons, a team inside during tournaments, about the same for league now. Um, but, and everybody on the field now does not have to wear a mask by the state guidelines. Um, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. If you're not vaccinated, you're recommended to wear a mask at all outdoor events. But, um, as David is probably knows with the school district, Everybody has a different opinion on that and thinks they don't have to wear a mask if they don't want to wear a mask. So, um, but it's gone very well. Um, last weekend, we, our city hosted tournaments, which, uh, and our fast pitch tournaments that are rentals are all with waiting list of teams because people want to play, but they can't go other places due to having to have COVID tests before you go into some other States and stuff. So they're playing here and uh, we're having a tournament next weekend, 48 teams. We have a waiting list of 14 teams for that, that they're still calling me. Can I get in? Like schedules out, teams are paid. We're going with the 48 we have. Um, and it, it is pretty incredible on how many people want to play in Wallace. So um, tournament wise, we're booked every weekend between pretty much the middle of April till the end of September. And like I said, the ones we're hosting and the fast pitch ones are over full. We're going to have three, softball tournaments that moved from Portland because of one, they were tired of fighting with them over COVID restrictions to the Portland parks and rec uh, decided to take over um, booking their own fields and doubled the fees that were used to be charged. So they're coming down here. We're bringing in, I believe over 50 teams on the last weekend of June of adults. And they're coming from the whole Western half of the United States. Uh, as long as COVID, the guidelines don't change and make them have to go elsewhere. So and I think that's pretty much all I have. If you guys have any questions. Oh, our national, which is July uh, 27th to August 1st. It's a, it's a five-day tournament, 14A Western Nationals. Uh, we're already at 28 teams and have tons of calls from some other states that they're not being allowed to play in their nationals that they were planning on going to in other states and they're looking at coming here. So hopefully they'll get qualified and get to join ours. And I, I will be 
happy at 30 some teens in this age group. I'll be thrilled if we got to get over 40 because they'll be from all over the Western half of the United States with that. So that's great. I think that's all I have, Dylan. Just a quick question in terms of the teams coming. Mm -hmm. You, and I think this was in Jennifer's update, but how is the security situation at Wallace and some of the, I know that, that I think I saw that there was security <laughs> hired. Is that, it sounds like that's not driving people away, which is good. Well, we, we, we take a lot of complaints. It's uh, on the youth weekends we've gone. Originally, the security was just being Friday, Saturday night evenings with our staff pretty much to help when the staff was prepping fields because we go from, you know, about 400 people out there during league and they leave and it leaves three to five people prepping the fields for the next day's tournament. And the people that live out there right now um, kind of think that's the time to come harass people. So we had, we did bring in a security company um, actually tried to work with the police department um, of even having some off duty officers come work a little extra, but they just, they're all over, as you guys all well know, they're well overwhelmed with overtime as it is. And it just didn't work out where I, I could find out 10 minutes before they were supposed to be there that it wasn't going to happen because, you know, somebody called in sick and they have to go cover their shift. So uh, we hired a security company on a temporary basis right now. Um, we are in the process of doing a RFP um, for the rest of the year and possibly into next year. Um, and then we've been bringing them out on the weekends because we have right now with so many people having to sit outside the complex to watch their kids um, little kids around and just a lot of people in the parking lot. We don't want that, uh, back that image of things happening, uh, either to people's cars getting broken or those people. So, um, at this point uh, during some of the bigger tournaments, we will have them there during the day too. So on the weekends. Thank you, uh, Paul. I saw you. Yeah. yeah the, the description is kind of like famine and feast, uh, COVID year was famine, but, uh, you're, you're kind of uh, overbooked and uh, feasting, but uh, that's that's better than famine for sure. Yeah, um, it, it is a really good thing. Um, I think because we ran last summer and we, uh, you know, I got to tell you, talking to, I, I meet every other week with all the Parks and Recs complexes online. Um, it's been a great thing for our group because we used to meet once every six months on, you know, at a meeting somewhere, but we're talking every week and I think with us um, being uh, enforcing all the guidelines last year, pe people respected that. There were some other areas that tried to run and they got shut down by their counties because they weren't enforcing the mass and the number of people. And people feel safe when they come to Wallace. The, the situation with why I have to have security is kind of hurting us a little, but we're uh, I've actually got an email to return to a grandparent that is not happy with us because we're not allowing them all inside the complex and we're having to deal with those people but um i just talked to my staff and we have not really had an issue well we've got the youth tournaments going um so and you know my big concern is they come in on saturday morning their cars are loaded with their stuff before they go to a hotel and then sunday they got to check out before their games are over and their cars are full of stuff so um temptation there so by having our security there to kind of keep them away um, it really does help our reputation. So did I answer everything, Paul? Oh, yes, that was saying okay. just everybody's working hard and it certainly is a boon uh, for the community to have all those yeah. people coming in, you know, renting rooms and using the restaurants or whatever, you know. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so, yeah I'm very popular so, with our hotels right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, I saw your hand and then Alan. Well, I just had a, a question. I'm not sure if you have the numbers, but I was just wondering if you know about how many Salem residents are served to each year. Oh, uh, yeah, I do know those numbers. Uh, so in league, we have about, I think it just varies and I think it'll be up this year. We have about 3,500 to 4,000 people playing in league every year. Um, some of them, you know, they play on four or five teams, but we try to break that down and just count them once in our final numbers. Um, not always possible because Fred will enter under Fred, you know, one time and then he'll use a nickname the next time he's on the league roster. But um, just for an example, but generally we try to break that down on our final numbers to just uh, one team 
you know, that one, one each person wants when we're counting the numbers, how many are coming. Um, and it, it just goes up and down, you know, like this year we're at 20 kickball teams, kickball teams are supposed to have 20 or less people that roster will, you know, they'll drop some, add some four or five times. So there could be 35 people play on a kickball team and they all come every week too. you know, softball teams, you get about, you got 20 on the roster, 11 or 12 will show up because the ones that aren't going to play only show up when they're begged to be there. Kickball. It's like, it's kind of a fun time for them. And it's a party when they get out there. And I mean, Jennifer's played on a league. Mark's played on a league. I mean, <laughs> Marilyn from the senior center, her and Jennifer had a team together. And if they ever put it together again, you guys, that's the night you need to come on a tour to watch them all play. Cause they have a good time and their families play with them. So that's a hint, Jennifer, just to let you know. And Mark, I'm not sure if Mark's on here tonight. So that's a rough estimate, David. I can probably get you some more numbers uh, if you need, if you want a little more accurate, because it's on one of the reports that I turn it into Tony every year. Okay, no, that's good. Thanks. You bet. Alan, you had a question. Oh, Alan, you're on mute. There you go. I, I want to commend you for recruiting and, and seeking out the, these these out of our area uh, teams. Uh, for two reasons. One, my primary focus is supporting recreational activities for the people who, in fact, live in Salem. And if we have adequate facilities and, and resources to do that. But we're realistically, when we bring outside teams in, that equates to, to top dollars because those heads and beds generate those, 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 those revenues that support a lot of activities. And plus, it, it increases the viability and, and the and the reputation of your city. And if we've got good facilities and do that well, it makes the city look good. And it certainly makes the parks department uh, look, looks good. So I commend you for drawing those in. I've served on other uh, boards uh, where they really focused on sports uh, in, within their park system. And it, all it does is add to it. It uh, keeps our fields in use and it also keeps, uh, keeps those, those top dollars rolling in. So congratulations. Well, thank you, Alan. And I want to thank all of you guys. We really do appreciate your support. And I know you guys have been pulled a lot dealing with the uh, homeless issue out there too. Um, and uh, just want to thank you guys for your support towards the recreation program. Um, Becky's our main face to you guys. And uh, she lets us know what's going on. And I appreciate that. So, um, but as Alan said, the top fields help. It'd be nice to have a really nice complex in the next five to 10 years. Cause, uh, the main turf field, Astro Turf Field, is closing down. Uh, Clackmas uh, has traded with their school district because they're building a new high school right next to it, and that will now be part of the high school fields. And one of them's not going to even be able to be used for softball anymore. So, um, if we could build ourselves a nice complex, we would bring in more teams and uh, have more going on. 365 days instead of just the eight eight nice months of the year that we get. Just out of curiosity, would you envision that being built out at Wallace or is there somewhere else in town that you're, in your uh, no, Wallace has this thing called the floodway. You can't build a turf complex in a floodplain or a floodway. If you want the warranty on it, it as North Salem can probably tell you when it floods, the little pellets go away from your turf field. So, um, no, I envision some property out on Hazel Green would be a perfect spot because it's right off the freeway and at the north end we would draw. There's a lot of teams from here that used to go up in the spring months. That might be why we're up a little bit. They're only running league right now this last year of Clackmas. They would go to uh, Clackmas in the spring and play because guaranteed they weren't going to rain out. Um, so we probably would draw a lot of those Portland teams down for league and then also uh, – um, more of our teams that kind of wait for those summer months would be more than willing to play, you know, in March. It's just, they don't want to spend that money and then play and play and not playing, you know? So, um, that is the perfect property. If Rob, Rob and uh, Patricia can make the design work. Sounds very worthwhile to look into. Yep. It would be. Any other questions? Yeah. Rick. Uh, yeah, um, I used to play a lot of league softball, and we uh, played a lot at the fairgrounds. Um, 
Now, obviously, they're not playing at the fairgrounds, but those were some pretty nice fields on the infield of the uh, the, the racetrack. Um, yes. Are those still available or a possibility? Mm -hmm. or? No. So when that uh, when the fairgrounds had a um, partnership or lease through, I think it was 1999 or whatever it was, um, when that happened, they tore those out when they built the pavilion. And oh, okay. The worst thing that ever happened was something happened with all, cause those were temporary backstops and stuff. And I'm not sure who owned them, if the city did or they did, but the, I have investigated with people that were around back at that point for parks and rec and they disappeared. Probably, probably became a scrap metal thing, but um, it, you know, that would have been nice to have those cause there are several places if we could like, even at Wallace, the original plan was three more fields out in the overflow parking area but nowadays to oh and that's the other thing dylan to build out at wallace nowadays uh, anything you have to make it temporary it's got to be taken out in the winter because we're grandfathered in right now where fema at any time could tell us to take wallace out and make it a um, temporary thing they could tell us we have to take our fences up and down every year and our building and everything but it was grandfathered in because it was originally a flood plain when it was built but now it's a floodway, which means it's an official part of the river. So, okay. but yeah, no, that would be nice if we had those four fields that really, um, I, for those of you that don't know, um, we, they, we played league out there with the former vendor. Um, I think my wife's probably coached at least 200 softball games out there for youth sports. When we first got married, we had a couple teams that she was the coach of for high school kids in the summer. And we played that. That's where they put you. They let the adults play at Wallace. And they sent us to the fairgrounds. Um, and it was awesome because we could have the, the tournament that used to be the biggest one on the West Coast was held here in Salem at that time because you had nine fields that were at two complexes plus a couple of um, you had River Road and you had Bush Park. So they had 11 fields at all times available for those big tournaments and uh, used to have like a 290 team tournament in three days so play at the two places but and that's something that we could do if we added the complex and kept uh wallace going we could go back to running some of those really big invitationals that are owned by company private companies that run them they're always looking for places to rent and they bring in millions of dollars in a three-day time for those <laughs> yeah well it just shows how how old i am that i remember <laughs> there i guess Oh, you're a young guy. I remember those, but I was in my early 20s. Then. Well, I wasn't young when I was playing there. That's the problem. <laughs> hey, we got a seat. That's, oh, that's the one thing we have going I didn't tell you guys about. Um, our senior leagues always played at night because a lot of the guys are still working, but we have a daytime group. They're calling themselves Salem Senior Softball League. Um, they are renting the park from us on Tuesdays. Right now, I think they have four or five teams. Um, they used to all drive to Portland to play, but then they figured out they have enough of them in Salem and they're renting the park for about four hours on Tuesdays and playing on two of the fields. Um, we probably will put that as part of our league next year, uh, just because the two guys that have taken this on realize there's a little more to administration. And when you're playing in there and being the administrator, you're not the popular guy all the time. So they have been talking to us about making that part of our league, which with them having four teams, I think we could make that work. Great. Perfect. Any more questions for Billy? Well, thank All you right. Thank you, guys. Billy. Really great to see you and uh, exciting prospects for potentially a Hazel Green sports facility in the next 10 years. I like yep. that a lot. I'd like to see that before I retire, which that would be about then, getting close then. So um, also, you guys are invited to come out anytime you want. Uh, during the nationals, come on out. As you know, some of you know, we will uh, supply you lunch with our umpire group and uh, let you watch some games. And and it's a pretty good spread that we supply for the umpires. So the, to get them to come here for a week of their vacation time. So, well, I think we'd love that. We we all missed the yeah. opportunity to have some in person yeah. time last year. So it'd be great. Uh, hopefully, yeah. if we hit that target where those things are possible again with the city protocols. So I, I yeah. think some of us would love to come out there this year. Okay. Well, talk to you guys soon. All right. Hope to see you in person then this summer. Sounds All good. Right. Thanks, Billy. Thank you.
All right, let's go into our next item. Should be fairly quick, as I was just going to provide a quick update on the Parks Usage and Permitting Subcommittee. I know we do have Robert, and um, I will let him chime in with anything I forget, because really Robert is doing all the hard work right now. Um, so we have been, we've decided to do most of our own homework on our own for the time being. I think there, this agenda was mailed out in the packet or emailed out. Um, but just to run, to give you all a rundown of the timeline, in May, June, we're doing our individual review of regulations. So uh, we have a nice bit of homework reading through different codes, uh, different rules and regulations, doing reviews of other cities. Uh, I think Woody gets the gold star, at least what's been sent out so far by both noticing an omission and sending some ideas from other areas. So thank you, Woody, for being so diligent right off the bat. In June and July, we're gonna be meet, working as a group to meet with uh, both the Human Rights Commission and the LGBTQQIA Intersectional Rights Task Force, which is a subset of HRC. So we're gonna have those meetings to have a little bit more discussion about any, anything that we could be doing further, hearing what uh, they think could be done in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and continuing to work individually because there are a lot of different areas for us to research. July, we're gonna work as a subcommittee to, and these are gonna be public meetings with an opportunity for public comment. August, our plan is to come back to SCRAB and present what we found, and then in August or September, present to City Council on behalf of SCRAB as a whole. As you'll note, you know, our original plan was to hopefully have an update in July, and I think Robert rightfully noted that we, should, we need a little bit more time to spread these out. So right now our target is August, and very well could be that we have something to report in July, but then August is our firm date. It could also be that September is our firm date to present to SCRAB. So we're we're still trying to wade into everything and get a good sense of what's out there, but I think there's already some great recommendations coming up just in terms of areas to look, and we will keep you all posted on opportunities for spread, sharing this with the public and what we find. Robert, anything you would add to that? Well, I would say at the moment, uh, you guys are probably doing all the hard work. I'm just feeding you documents and reviews and permits and statutes and ordinances and examples and policies and plans um, so thank you all for your dedication to the task. Um, and uh, yeah, good job. Thanks. That, that's it, Dylan. <laughs> and I would just encourage everyone else on the on SPRAB, if, if you have ideas or thoughts, or if you have questions that you would you would raise, you know, please send those to myself or to Robert or to Tony. And um, that way we can consider those. I know there at least Mickey and I, I think a few others might have thought about joining the task force with the subcommittee. And so if you if you have those thoughts, you know, please in inject those now so we can be thinking of those ideas and make sure that we're including ideas from everyone in the process and not just when we get to the part where SPRAB as a whole endorses it. Are there any questions um, for Robert or I about the subcommittee work? Yeah, Dave. Oh, one question. I was wondering if the resources or any documents that are being shared with the committee could be shared with the board so we're more up to speed when we get to our meeting sure i can uh, work with tony and we will send you the swath of, of, of uh, documents absolutely okay thank you it's gripping reading <laughs> It is fascinating, I will say, just to dive into it and see everything referenced and sometimes trying to track it down. Robert and I had a conversation and he made a, a great comparison to how lucky we are to have the internet right now to be able to go from one city code to another versus trying to have a bookshelf where you're digging through papers to find all of this. So it, it is really nice to have hyperlinks. Anything else before? Yeah, Mickey. Um, I had, um, first of all, I really appreciate all of you that volunteered to be on the subcommittee because I know there's a lot of material and it takes a lot of time and I just really appreciate all of your willingness to jump in there. Um, my, my question is just more of a formality since there was a formal motion to create the committee with a report being presented on July 8th. Is there anything we have to do other than just the statement in the minutes this evening that uh, there won't be a report until August? That's a really good question. Um, you know, I guess, Mark, I would open it up as if there, if you have any thoughts, I think, and I can pull up the minutes here. I believe what we said was its first report to SPRAB would be July 8th. And so perhaps the language at that point is that we can give an update similar to this on July 8th. And I think hopefully that would be sufficient to just give a progress report um, at that point and let you know what we're, what, what our projected timeline is. And I, and in terms of the motion language, we didn't say it would have to be finished by that point. So I would hope that would be sufficient. Yeah. Yeah. Chair McDowell, if I may, um, yeah. 
I, I do recall there being a, a fairly robust discussion at the time that the motion was being considered and timelines were being put out about the concern as to whether or not the subcommittee would be in a position to present its full report at the July meeting. And there was discussion at that time that uh, we can do it if, if the subcommittee wasn't done, that um, at a minimum, some type of an update and a discussion of a revised timeline. So I don't have the minutes in front of me unless it specifically sets out benchmarks in there as to what will be presented. I think a discussion of what the subcommittee has done, um, what it is going to be doing, um, and just updating the board as to um, sort of where where the subcommittee is at and what the future for the subcommittee holds, and then um, a discussion as to future timelines for future updates or the full report to the committee would be more than sufficient. Fantastic. Thank you, Mickey, for raising that, though. It's good for us to make sure we're, we're being honest with it and we're staying true to what we, what, what we set forth. Thank you. Alan, yes. Actually, I am looking at the minutes, and I think we talked about that in, in length. And it says that the chair suggested that the timeline be flexible based upon reevaluation at the July spread meeting, which is exactly what we're doing. Perfect. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, well, thank you, Robert, again, for keeping all this organized. And I look forward to um, some of our first meetings starting up in just over a month. Thanks, and I say that to the members of the subcommittee. Yeah, well done, everybody. Perfect, well, we are moving right along with our agenda tonight. Let's go into the Mission Street Park Conservancy minutes. I don't know if we have anyone on behalf of the Conservancy with us tonight. Trying to look through the agenda or the participant list real quick. Um, but were there any questions that, that anyone had, the members of the board, regarding the minutes that we could raise or that we should raise? I had one, um, I will just make, sorry, let me just pull these up here. That on the first page, I noticed talking about the, oh, let's see, this is the third bullet down under old business. It talked about. <laughs> a brick die, a brickwork project, and then it said that the sundial would be added next year. Letters of support are being sought from several groups, including SPRAB. And so I wasn't sure exactly what the letter of support entailed at that point, or if that was something that had come up, and I, I just couldn't recall. And so I don't know if, if there is anyone from Mission Streets Park Conservancy on now. Otherwise, Tony, perhaps we could follow up with them via email afterward just to get clarity on that bullet point. Certainly, I, I'm happy to do that. I do not see Christine uh, on our list of participants. Perfect. And I can follow up with her on that. Thank you so much. And I, I don't think that, I'm assuming they'll come to us when it's ready, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a missed communication on that piece. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm not seeing any other hands, so we can go on into our urban forestry report. And I don't know if we have Mylan with us tonight. Don't believe so. Were there any questions? Um, I, we can ask Jennifer or Tony to relay those questions for us. Yeah, Paul. Yeah, I, I just like to say how clear and comprehensive it was uh, written. Also, uh, to be honest, I kind of like on some of these reports when they've included some pictures uh, with the agenda, it's just kind of gives me a little better uh, view of what, you know, what, what they're talking about. Um, but again, I uh, kind of continue to be uh, impressed with how it's going. And then those two maps that we had regarding uh, responding to uh, issues and where they are with it. So, uh, um, uh, so I, I'm, Really, uh, you know, again, impressed with it, how comprehensive it is, and you get a clear idea of what's what they're doing. I would second that and just say I agree that the, the way it's written out is really easy to follow, really comprehensive, and including the photos, I did not know how, how you could move such a big tree in that process. So it was really fun to see that in terms of the new, the new Christmas tree potentially down that went down at Riverfront Park. So I really appreciate all the work Mylan put into that. Mickey, go ahead. 
Oh, I, I will third what all of you said because it was a wonderful report. I just really appreciate it and all the GIS stuff and the tracking. And there must be, I don't know, Mylon must just never sleep or something because he said all the everything having to do with trees still goes through him. Like, how does he fit it all in? I think it's amazing. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Well, only one comment on that Christmas tree. They did choose a giant sequoia in, in 40 years. It looked like one of those star trees on the Willamette uh, University campus. So uh, uh, they're going to need a lot more lights, I think. Dave, yeah. Yeah, I had one question I noted. I was wondering uh, with the tree replanting, and I assume that they're doing this, but I remember when we were talking a while back, oh, it was probably a year or two ago, where they were uh, assessing the, the variety of trees in the in the uh, city. And I was wondering if that was being considered with the tree replanting uh, to keep a good mix of, of varieties uh, going back in. Looks like Jennifer raised her hand. Um, she might not have co-host abilities. Let's see if we can get her. Um, yeah, Mitch, there we go. Can, can you do that? Jennifer, looks like you're unmuted now. Can I can't, so I just can, I was just, if you don't mind, I'll just um, respond yeah. to Dave's question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, so, so um, yes, the city, uh, because of the overwhelming number of trees that we have to, to have to plant, we do have current tree planting um, uh, contracts with Friends of Trees and, and an entity called Treecology. And I know that's been referenced in previous meetings, but because of the large volume of trees that we're going to have to replace and, and plant because of the ice storm, we are going out uh, for, uh, with an RFP. Uh, for uh, planting services, uh, water establishment period uh, 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 as a portion of that, uh, stump grinding, all of those pieces. But part of that solicitation will, uh, what's been provided is that tree planting list that's been updated, which has taken into account um, the varieties of trees uh, that we either have an abundance of currently that so we we want to hold back on some of those plantings um, or that just are, are uh, um, not appropriate or, or more native trees that we can plant. So all of that was kind of factored in with the with the RFP that we're in the process of going out with. Thank you. Um, I had a, actually a question I, I see I flagged here is that it Notes they're continuing with to work with Robert Chandler on updating SRC 86 and look forward to new changes. And I was just trying to remember the nature of the changes that are being considered right now. And Robert, perhaps you might be the best person to speak to that. There I am. Yes, I can give you a, a quick update. I mean, there's some, I'll say relatively mundane, don't let Mylon hear me say that. Uh, we're changing the table in the back of SRC 86 or they can start the administrative rule supporting SRC 86 on what are the allowed and prohibited uh, trees for planting. Um, there is uh, now, uh, so there are two bodies of work uh, at work. One is the code, Salem Revised Code Chapter 86, uh, which is uh, city owned trees. And the other one is the associated administrative rule that uh, supports and expands on the code. So both of those going hand in hand uh, in addition to changing the uh, prohibited and allowed tree list, one of the changes is being more clear on when the director may refer a matter to SPRAB for feedback. Uh, as you recall, there was an issue well over a year and a bit ago on um, you know, asking for input on a city project that involves removal or not of street trees. That uh, we're trying to clarify the process in the administrative rule and ensuring the director has the authority to do that in the code. Uh, another one has to do with enforcement of violations of the code. We're making it clear how we do the assessment of the value of the trees, um, that the civil penalty is in addition to the uh, repayment of the value of the tree, which is in addition to the repayment of the um, um, cost for restoration. And we're adding provision that says what we really want to do is that the violator uh, pays us the cost of restoration and we take over the restoration activities. Uh, there are a couple other uh, aspects of this, but those are the highlights of it that we're working on. And it involves 
uh, city, uh, city, man or city manager's office, city attorney's office, community development department, and public works department. And out of curiosity, in terms of, especially the one in, in terms of how issues get related to SPRAB and especially re referencing the incident you're talking about with that um, one particular case, is that something that will then, how do those administrative rules get updated? Is that something council then approves or does that go through SPRAB or do we have any say in, in how that process gets laid out considering where it, it is altering what comes before us? Well, we certainly hope to have you uh, get your feedback. Uh, administratively, the way it works is a change in code has public notice as a public hearing typically goes to city council, first reading, second reading, uh, the, the full process. An administrative rule, the process is the department responsible for the administrative rule puts out public notice saying we're changing the rule. This is what we're doing. Uh, we accept public comment depending on the comments we modify to make the rule better. Uh, and then we notify city council at the same time that we are coming up with an administrative rule. The council has the option at that point of calling it up to, uh, for a public hearing. If council, did, if we get the public input and we make the changes and council does not call it up for public hearing, the administrative rule is then approved and adopted administratively. It's by an act of the, of the department. I, I, Mark doesn't know this, but I'm looking at uh, Mark Square. How do I do, Mark? <laughs> uh, you explained that very well. Thanks. So I, I guess I would just ask then that as especially the ones that pertain directly to SPRAB as those do come forward and that public notice is put out, you know, if you or Tony could make sure that that's shared with all of us, that would be wonderful. Oh, absolutely. And if, you know, we have a couple of questions that we see, you know, we're thinking about, you know, several options um, and we'd like to get SPRAB's input. Uh, we'll put that, get up, try to get on the agenda and spend a few moments of discussion with you all. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Mickey, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I, I did. Since this process is still going on with the updating of the code and, and the rules, I, are there also updates being made to the tree list to reflect uh, our warming climate and what those trees are going to be facing in 10 to 15 years? The answer is yes, there are, there is a whole a, a totally replacement of whatever the table is in SRC 86, the revised code, chapter 86 in the administrative rule. We're replacing that table with what is allowed and what trees are prohibited. I don't know whether part of the decision about adding and removing trees was based on climate change. I think part of it was diversity to avoid uh, species mm -hmm. die out catastrophically. Uh, but at, this moment beyond, I will raise the engineer <laughs> and defer to Mylan for his feedback. Uh, if you want to know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was. It came up in uh, one of those classes that were available. I don't know when. When was it? Last summer, <laughs> on developing a street tree list, and they were talking about. Uh, in this area, we may want to look more at trees that are currently lit, currently doing well in California, for instance you know, just shifting a little bit to trees that do better when it's drier and warmer. Sure. Tony, can you make sure that question gets passed to Mylan and we'll get uh, some answers or an answer? I yes, I will. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. Woody. Yeah, I was on that committee that rewrote that list along with Mylan and um, a, a lot of it is that, uh, you know, there, there's a discussion about wanting to use natives but there's, I don't know if it, it, um, the city removed a, a native maple tree, you know, across the driveway from Deepwood a couple three weeks ago. Um, and there's a bunch of them in the rough area of Deepwood that are dying out too. So that native is not necessarily the best way to go because the climate is changing and those are very hypersensitive trees. So. You almost have to, when you order new trees from nurseries, you almost want to order them from Roseburg or Northern California or somewhere where they're, they've uh, been growing in, in a warmer climate that they can, you know, over the years would be better adapted to what we're, um, what our climate's doing now. Thanks, Woody. I forgot you were part of that uh, development committee. So does that help you, uh, help answer your question, Mickey? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you. 
Perfect. Any further questions for Robert or anyone else about the, um, the urban forestry update? All right. Thank you, Robert. I bet you didn't expect to be on the mic this much tonight. <laughs> I, I did not. I'm glad I actually uh, tuned in, zoomed in. Um, I'm glad I was able to be helpful. And again, thank, thank you, you for being here. Let's move into our parks operations update. And any questions for Jennifer based on this one, also a wonderful report. And also, Jennifer, thank you for all the photos. It is really helpful just to have context of everything you're talking about. You're welcome. Um, if you'd like me to circle back to Mickey's earlier question relative to the signage that's yes. going up in, in on that, if, if, if this is, would be a good time. Um, so, so far, I mean, predominantly um, since that process has started, that has been utilized at Wallace for the cleanups at Wallace. Um, and, and that's been fairly effective um, in the areas that have, have been cleaned so far at Wallace. Um, today was the first uh, day that signs were put up on Monday. So with that 72 hour uh, period, so they were put up by SPD on Monday to which we uh, did a, a Cascade Gateway, the alternate park where camping is allowed. Um, the area of focus today was the, the Beaver Grove shelter area in the Southeast Meadow, which is for those of you familiar with Cascade, it's pretty centralized in the middle of the park. And um, so while that same process was, will you, was used, it'll be interesting to see, especially because of the whole pavilion area and the shelters and, and how they've been uh, being so widely used during this camping period, how effective that process will be. It worked today. Uh, you know, there were uh, about um, uh, 11 campsites as well as the Beaver Grove shelter area where uh, folks were, were relocated uh, by the time the, the cleanup started today. Um, it'll be interesting to see at Cascades um, because obviously there's not as much public use at Cascades. Uh -huh. So it's a little different scenario than Wallace um, on whether they circle back uh, uh, around now that that cleanup has transpired. And if we end up having to kind of do some uh, repeat steps um, in, in areas that have previously been cleaned. But, but so far at Wallace anyway, in the other areas, it's been pretty effective. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Paul. Yeah, I, from the report, it looks like so far it's going along pretty well and people are being reasonably cooperative. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that you, Obviously, we you have to tread lightly in terms of uh, uh, telling people to move. But once you've cleaned an area, do you have a little more, I suppose that comes from the signage, a little more uh, leverage of people trying to move back in? Well, again, you know, it's, a, it's really a different scenario at Cascade than it is at Wallace. So at Wallace, as soon as those folks have been relocated, we've gone in and we've mowed and we've started some of those um, normal kind of maintenance procedures that we do and then put up the signage that it's for recreational use only and, and those kinds of things. Um, you know, Wallace has uh, a lot more uh, uh, rec uh, public recreation that's transpiring. Um, you know, Cascades uh, at this point in time and really for the last year or so, uh, realistically for all intents and pur purposes has had none. Um, and so, you know, there, that's which is, so, you know, uh, that's a very different scenario. Um, and so that's why I'm saying it'll be, it'll be interesting to see, um, we're following the same process at Cascade, but whether the same response from those that are camping there will be had at Cascade as it does uh, that has been had at, at Wallace when you don't have the public uh, and things scheduled there and the, and the same level of, of public use. So, so, so we'll see, um, you know, we're going out for the next couple of weeks, three weeks, I think, um, we'll be at Cascade. So we'll certainly see next Thursday, um, you know, as we, you know, go back to do another area, if, if those folks who were located in the areas that were just done this week have uh, basically just gone back to the area they were before, it's just now clean for them. So yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll be sure and update that in future reports on, on that effectiveness, especially, you know, the difference between Wallace and Cascade. Well, it's certainly a complicated situation. And I uh, say it's uh, kudos to you for taking this carefully and doing the cleanups as, th as 
frequently as you do, because it's quite a mess. Yeah, it, well, and it's quite, you know, it's really quite a, a, a collaborative city effort. It certainly isn't just, uh, you know, it isn't just parks. It's, it's a lot of um, social service providers that are helping. It's, you know, the city manager's office, Gretchen, her role, SPD, um, other public works departments outside of parks, just because we only have a certain number of, and, uh, of staffing and with the frequency of these cleanups occurring. So we've had, you know, some support from other public works departments, you know, helping drive metal, tr the trucks that we uh, put the recycling in or the metals in and those kinds of things to help provide support. So it's really been, you know, a, 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 while parks is kind of spearheading a lot of the, the work and the uh, stuff from that standpoint, it's, it's definitely a collaborative effort between uh, a lot of entities to try to make it successful and keep it moving, consistently moving forward. Any additional questions for Jennifer? I'll just second what Paul was saying, that great work. And I, I know there's this has been quite a month, obviously, with June 1st being the deadline or the, the transition period of, of camping being allowed. And I just know there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. So appreciate the report and all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Okay, well, let's move right into our recreation services update. Um, Becky, do we, I, I know we also, we heard from your team as well, your colleagues, but do we have you? Oh, there you are, perfect. And I see just now that Tony sent out the stride dates. Thank you, Tony, for sharing those yes. with us. Yeah. Any other updates you would share with us, Becky, that was not covered in the report or shared by Billy and Melinda? Um, well, my main thing, and, and it may be kind of a little bit related to recreation, but is also parks um, that I wanted to let people know, and it was in Jennifer's write-up that uh, the splash pads or splash fountains are uh, going to be reopening. Those haven't operated since 2019, so oh. that's a, a, big, a big thing that's happening, and a lot of, you know... A, hate to go from that but we have the new restroom building in riverfront and uh, i put that in my report i can't uh express this enough but uh, i've had at least one uh event we're just now getting ready to start hosting events again in our park system and uh, that started on memorial day so this will be the next weekend the second time that we've been able to do that and I have one event already that's saving hundreds of dollars uh, in, you know, not needing to rent chemical toilets or porta potties, things like that. So um, some new things that we've got going on specifically at Riverfront, um, but just, I mean, we're getting a lot of requests. It's really kind of nice to start having use again in our park system. So um we're excited to be able to do that. And the public is ready and very excited to get back out and start using our wonderful parks. So we're excited to do that. And I wonderful. think there will be a lot of, a lot of good things coming this summer. So and looking forward to it. Apologies if I missed any announcement about this, but have there been plans made for 4th of July and given COVID and everything <laughs> like that? Yeah, it's interesting you would ask that question. Um, so back in early of 2021, I'm thinking, you know, March, April, there was a lot of discussion about whether we should go forward with it. Um, it was decided in April that we just, with the uncertainty of everything, that uh, we were not going to offer the fireworks show this year at Riverfront. Um, this would be the second year. Obviously, we didn't do it in 2020. Um, there was a little bit of a flurry of, of emails last week internally about whether or not maybe we could do it or should do it. Um, it's just uh, being a month away. Unfortunately, um, whether the fireworks provider could even mm -hmm. shoot off the fireworks and we had the, they actually had the material on the, the shells is one thing, but just the security, the park staffing, the police staffing, ordering chemical toilets, um, just 
there was a lot of things to try to get done in a short period of time. So it was decided actually on Monday again, that, you know, as tough as it is to not have that, Mm -hmm. um, we're just not in a position by July 1st to be, or excuse me, July 4th to be able to do that safely. So July, uh, July 4th, 2022, we'll be (laughs) ready to roll. (laughs) Put it on my calendar, but that makes a lot of sense. There's a lot of planning that goes into that. Yeah. Any other questions for Becky? Dave. I have a question. Um, I was trying to uh, submit a parks reservation application, and I didn't find it very simple to try to figure out where the application is on the website. I was wondering okay. if, that, if that could be improved so that it was more obvious, you know, select here to for the application. Well, um, I can talk to IT and our internal uh, administrative staff on that. Um, what was it for a park use? It's for uh, a park. Was that what it was for? Okay. Yeah, this okay. was for a school use of a park. Um, okay. But when you look on the website, it just says the place you find it, it says your completed application, but it doesn't really say oh, this is the application. So, okay. It, okay. it wasn't very, it's not very intuitive and it took me a little while to find it. Okay. And I'm thinking okay. maybe we could make that simpler for people. Yeah, um, absolutely. I'll, I'll definitely take your input and uh, talk to staff and also um, our, our IT department. Um, it's my understanding. I've heard a little bit of information about the possibility of, of again, kind of reworking the city's website. So that might be part of it. I'm not sure. But in the meantime, um, if you or if anybody has questions, uh, you can email us directly and we can get, get email you back the form so you don't have to search for it, that kind of thing. So if we can be of help with that. In the meantime, don't hesitate to reach out, but I will talk to staff about that. Yeah, I figured it out, but it's not very intuitive. Yeah. So maybe yeah. it could be simpler. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I had a question um, thinking about stride events um, a long mm-hmm. ways out, but I know at one point we talked about a holiday run and I brought up just yeah. curious about that. And you mentioned someone, I can't remember whom, but it had been pushing for that as well. And, and knowing that things have to be planned far out, is that a conversation that's still underway? And uh, when, when, if anywhere, is there a good point for me to help out in terms of if there's anything I can do um, both as a volunteer or via SPRAB? Right. Yeah, no, it definitely is. In fact, I have a little tickler in my email that comes up about every two or three weeks uh, about that. So um, there was a person, uh, of course, unfortunately, over the course of the last two years, this particular individual that does running events that I had mentioned before, um, hasn't had the opportunity to hold events. <laughs> uh, so I haven't had immediate recent contact with him, but uh, I think Melinda, uh, you had her on earlier. She, she uh, I would be the one that would work with her. And I think that we'd like to try to move forward with that. And there was conversation about maybe doing it, um, whether or not we do it in conjunction with the tree lighting. Mm-hmm. Um but we're, we're looking at, I mean, obviously that tree lighting is the first Friday, usually first Friday in December. Um, there is a possibility. I mean, hopefully, obviously this year we're able to have the event. Um, but if we could do something prior to that or in conjunction with that event, either on that Friday or even the next, the next day on Saturday, maybe. Yeah. Um, that is in the plans and I am working with Melinda on that right now. So. We'll, we'll let you know. We'll contact you if you want to help out with it. I'd love to. Yeah, I think that'd be a great opportunity. Okay. Great. Perfect. Any other questions for Becky? Okay. Well, thank you so much, Becky. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are almost on track with the agenda items as, as they're written, which is uh, the first time in a while. So kudos to everyone. Um, going into new business, is there anything that anyone would like to bring up that we have not covered so far? Alan, you're on mute.
There you go. I realize we're at the eleventh hour, but uh, the city budget's coming up for for vote very very soon. Has this body ever taken a stand supporting the the, the parks portion of that budget, or include encouraging adaption of that? Uh, is there anything we can do to to support parks and making sure that their budget gets uh, gets passed as as presented? I just don't know. That's I'm asking. It's a great question, Jennifer. I, I imagine you'd be the best suited to answer that. So I know in in previous uh, years with the previous uh, chair that they have written a letter of uh, support, and I believe that she um, attended uh, the the council meeting and provided that and provided that in 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 advance. Um, I don't think that that's been done the last uh, couple or so years, but I. My recollection was is that had happened in in the past. Tony would Tony would be Tony can chime in as well too, but to see if if she remembers if that's my recollection is correct. Would it be helpful? Yes. Jennifer, if it, does it? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Tony. Oh, I just wanted to add. Um, yes, Jennifer. Actually, in years past, before we changed uh, to that new format of strategic plan. Uh, the chair would go to the budget committee meeting that was focused on the parks budget. And then that's when they presented the annual report and then offered um, you know, their suggestions or their support for certain items in the budget, uh, park related art items, parks, operations, recreation services. So now that we've moved to submitting our annual report in the fall, which is when the city council is preparing the budget um, and looking at how uh, different projects align with their values, uh, the mission, vision, and values. That's how we're presenting it now. But, um, you know, I, I think if the board wanted to submit a letter um, of support, I think that, that would be a great idea. It would need to go forward, you know, pretty darn quick. So tonight. When is when is the council vote on that? I think it's coming up. I think Robert, isn't it the or Mark, isn't it the upcoming city council meeting that they're voting on the budget? It, uh, sorry, it is uh, this coming council meeting. This is next Monday, what the fourteenth, that uh, council will be considering the budget. The ideal scenario is they vote to approve it on the fourteenth. If they choose to uh, defer that decision, they have the following uh, on the 28th, uh, where they have to act on council. I'm sorry, where they have to act on the budget. <laughs> Helen, thank you for raising this. This is a good conversation. Is this um, how does how does the board feel? And um, you know, Alan, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you be interested in helping drafting a, a letter that we could? If we can get the if the content is essentially we as the board are in support of that, is there is there an easy way that we can make this happen in the next few days, or how does everyone feel about that? One, I would be glad to help, but we may be, as I said, I know this is eleventh hour. We may be a little bit too too little too late to have an impact on this on this year's budget, but perhaps we could think about it in preparation for next year, or we can still get a letter and it doesn't take much time to generate that. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, we want to stay connected with council representing parks and parks issues and, and parks priorities. And they have asked us to do things and we, by in turn, I don't think it's unrealistic to ask it for us to ask them to give full consideration to the parks budget request. Now I realize the city manager has been through the, the, the budget committee and all of that, but uh, I don't know what's on the wish list. I don't know what's, you know, what's still at play uh, in, in the budget, but uh, we want to make sure that uh, the parks gets the money they need because it's been some challenging last year and a half on, on parks. Absolutely. Tony, I see you raised your hand. I just wanted to add that, however, you know, whatever you decide tonight, if you wanted to submit a letter, um, we could get that in on Monday and uh, Dylan or Mickey, you could, um, you know, speak to the council on Monday based on that letter that was supported or that was provided.
as long as you have, you know, as long as you have a emotion that supports that. What do others think? Paul? Yeah, I, I, you know, it certainly can hurt, you know, I mean, I think I just putting a positive note on it, I think the parks have good support in the council, uh, but it certainly would hurt if we just say that the, the board is, you know, is in full support of a, of a fully funded uh, budget for the parks. And uh, uh, yeah, I certainly uh, think it would be a, a good thing to do. Obviously our time's limited and so forth. It might, the letter might be fairly general, but because uh, um, we don't have specific line items to deal with as far as the budget proposal right now, but uh, yeah, I think it would be a good thing to do. And I would make a, a motion to that uh, we do draft up just a letter of support for the arts budget uh, you know, for this coming year. Okay, we have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, second it, all right. Um, and now the, let's do, the motion is up for discussion for us to draft a letter. Uh, Rick, I saw you also had your hand up. Yeah, um, I attended a meeting a few years back where um, they were talking about the fact that we have this, about the same amount of green space in Salem as a comparable city of Eugene, but their budget is three times more than ours for their parks. And I don't know if that's changed at all in the last few years, but anything we can do to increase funding for parks is a real plus for the entire community. Great point. Alan, if we, you know, Tony, I see your hand is up. Uh, I'll make a note in the calendar for next year uh, to give the board plenty of time to consider uh, the items in the budget that's going forward so that you'll have a little more time. Uh, Wonderful. Thank you to for make that. that. Uh, Chair, Chair McDowell, if I might. Since there is not time for a uh, draft of a proposed letter to come back to this board, um, if this board is gonna go forward with crafting a letter, um, which I'm assuming, I think it should be identified as to whose signature is going to go on that letter. And I would recommend putting some specific things into the motion through amendment as to what it is this board, unless it's just simply um, some general language of this board, uh, ask this council to um, support, a, to consider a budget that fully funds our parks. And it's just that general, if there are gonna be some specific things that this board wants conveyed to the council in its letter, it should be reflected in the motion so that it is very clear when the letter is drafted that it is a representation of what this board as a whole is expecting to be conveyed to the council since there is not a chance in a public setting mm -hmm. for that letter to come back in time for it to be looked at by this board as a whole before going to council. Excellent points, thank you, Mark. And I would add one piece of that as well as, as to who, who will write the letter, uh, at least <laughs> to take the lead on it. I think it's, it's probably also very important for us to identify at this point. So it sounds like given the timeline, our, our option is to do something fairly straightforward. Basically, it would be on behalf of SPRAB, uh, essentially ask, considering asking council to consider the full request for the budget for parks and stating the, the need and the importance of, of parks, particularly in the last year is what I heard. Um, and I, I think that's very valid. Does, so we would need someone Perhaps Alan, not, once again, not to throw put, put this all on you, but uh, if, if you could turn something around fairly quickly, then we could sign it and send it off by Monday morning 
um, to council to receive that by midday so they would have that for consideration. Does that seem to line up with what everyone is thinking in regards to this motion? Well, I, I uh, as some of you may know, I had a death in the family a couple of weeks ago, but I'm pretty much caught up and I was trying to, uh, everything Dr. Chandler was, was sending to me, I was trying to read while I was traveling across the country, but I'm pretty much caught up. So I, I but it, it would have to be just as you said, a simple letter, the importance of supporting parks in this, in this upcoming budget. And we hope they'll give full consideration to the parks request and leave it at that. I think that sounds fantastic given the timeline and especially given what Tony suggested. Yes. Um, so my understanding is then if you would like to propose that as an entirety, as an amendment to the motion, then we'll vote on the amendment and then vote on the motion as a whole. That would be my, my motion uh, for a friendly amendment. If I may restate it for the record, then just to make sure that we're on that um, you, Alan, would draft the letter that would ask the council to fully support the budget request proposed by the Parks Department. And the letter would also state the importance of parks to Salem, particularly in the last year. And as is typical, the letter would be signed. Uh, I would sign it as board chair on behalf exactly. of the And if yeah. possible, it, if you could zoom in on that, on that meeting, uh, during the comment period, that'd be great. If you can't, then I'd ask the device chair to do that. That sounds wonderful. Um, Mickey, you and I can be in touch. I believe I can make that meeting uh, and I will let you, and I can talk to you on that afterward if there's any reason that I can't, unless you would like to go because I have represented Sprab before. And if you would like to go on behalf of Sprab this time, I'm very open to that as well. Um, either either way, since you're your chair, it's kind of your your first, but I am available for the meeting, so that would be wonderful. I mean, I can step in. <laughs> well, we, you um, and I can. Oh. If I might, um, under the current COVID uh, protocols for city council, public comment is only being taken um, through written submission. And I don't know what the deadline cutoff is. They are not uh, accepting in-person or via Zoom public comment. It has to be submitted in writing through the city recorder's office. Did that change recently? I, I believe that's how the city council has been accepting public testimony and public comment um, during the COVID period. Because we've got, I've given verbal testimony a few times to council during COVID where it's been virtual and they have us log in about 30 minutes early and you sign up the day of at, I think, 8 by 8 a.m. You, you may want to, uh, perhaps I'm getting it wrong, maybe there's just uh, public testimony and not public comment. Uh, you may want to just verify with the city recorder um, just to double check on that. I'd hate for you to show up to give. <laughs> public uh, testimony or public comment and not be in a position to do so. And I may um, be mixing up the two between the public testimony and the public comment portions. You know what? You are absolutely right because they do <laughs> allow the public comment and they put a timer on, right? And they, yes. you, you are right. I apologize for that. I'm getting my public testimony and my public comment, uh, Inter intertwined. Forgive me on that. No, I appreciate you you checking and making sure um, because it would it would have been unfortunate to show up for that. <laughs> so um, I want to go back for a moment. I know that we Alan had proposed the amendment, and I as I restated it, and I realized we did not get a second for the amendment as it was proposed. So is there a second for that amendment? Second. I second it. Okay, seconded. Thank you. So we can continue discussing the amendment, the amended motion. Um, Mickey, were there additional comments you were going to make? No, no, I think it sounds sounds great. You identified the, I guess, the three main points um, in the motion um, and that's wonderful. Okay, so I think we need to do two votes here, one to adopt the amendment to the motion and then one to adopt the motion as amended if I, if I follow Robert's rules correctly there. Um, so let us quickly, I think we can do a voice vote at least for the amendment and then we can do roll call or for the, sorry, yeah, and then for the full. So for the amendment, um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Okay, hearing none. So now we have the motion as amended. 
to write the letter to be submitted. Alan is going to draft it. I will be the one signing it. It will be very straightforward, simply noting that we request full funding for the parks and also stating the importance of parks. And I will also do my best to make sure I can attend. And if not, I will make sure to contact or to be in touch with Mickey and we'll be in touch. So at least one of us is representing SPRAB at this opportunity. So let's go through, or is there any further discussion first on the motion as amended? Hearing none, let's do a quick roll call vote. Mickey Varney. Aye. Alan Alexander. Aye. Tony Cato is absent. Woody Dukes. Aye. Dave Frydenmaker. Aye. Rick Hartwig. Aye. Keith Norris is absent and Paul Rice. Aye. And I vote aye as well. Motion as amended carries and we will get to work on that letter. Thank you, Alan, for bringing this up. And I really appreciate you putting this on our radar. So we make sure to raise our voice. Is there any further new business for us to consider? Okay. Well, with that, our next meeting is going to be July 8th. So after the holiday. So I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday and enjoys your time. Even if there's not firework display this year, I'm sure there'll be lots of wonderful opportunities out there. And um, thank you again, Alan, really appreciate you stepping up to write that letter and please be in touch if you need additional assistance, but we will make sure to get that underway. I will very soon. Thank you. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Have a great evening, everyone. Same for you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.